let's talk a little bit about supply chains. One of the uh, things that have uh, made uh, standard of living in the United States and in the rest of the world, for that matter, um, as high as it has become over the last, I'd say, 40 years, one of the things that has allowed for economic growth to continue in spite of the ever-growing regulatory state, in spite of the fact that taxes are, 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 are higher and higher and more and more manipulative, in spite of the fact that our educational system is horrific, and, and I think educational system all over the world are not particularly inspiring, in spite of all that, the economy's grown, quality of life, standard of living has gone up, uh, people are living better lives. I think life today is much better than, um, than uh, it has been uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, life has been getting systematically better decade by decade by decade in spite of people from the right and the left denying it. I think the reason for that has been, uh, you know, you could call it globalization and a real revolution in uh, the thinking about supply chains. Uh, the shift to just-in-time inventory management, uh, real uh, application of scientific knowledge to supply chain management. Now, what is supply chain? Supply chain is the, the, the chain of events, the chain of actions that is taken from the point where a product is manufactured to the point where the consumer picks it up, buys it and picks it up. So everything that has to happen, the, 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 the manufacture of all the pieces that go into the product. So I, I think I've told you the iPhone is made in 60 different countries. Pieces of the iPhone made in 60 different countries. The supply chain includes the production in each one of those countries. The delivery from each one of those countries to any other intermediate places where they need to be assembled to the final assembly, to the shipping to directly to the consumer or the shipping to the Apple store or the shipping to warehouses in, in Amazon and then Amazon supply chain from the uh, 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 warehouse to all of you. So everything that has to do with the movement of the goods from the point of production of every piece of it, including the mining, going back to the mining, every piece of it, all the way until it gets to you, the final consumer, all of that, all of that is the supply chain. All of that counts as supply chain, and managing that supply chain is complicated and an immense, huge achievement. It is absolutely non-trivial. There's an immense amount of thought Effort, math, algorithms, computer power, lots of strategy and thought that goes into devising and running and deploying effective and efficient supply chains. And one of the ideas of just-in-time management, just-in-time inventory management, is not having to, not having to, thank you, uh, Kirill, I appreciate it. Um, not having to uh, hold on to a lot of inventory because you know where every item is at every point in time. You know the entire supply chain. You can play around with it. You can add, you can, you can, uh, you know, adjust the levers to increase supply, decrease supply based on demand, and you can do it in real time. Do it in re real time. And. It's, it's stunningly amazing, efficient. Uh, Jennifer says this is all called logistics, yeah. It's all the logistics. And all of it is coordinated, of course, by the price signal. You know, you can read Hayek for that. You can read a textbook in economics for that. You know, where resources are meant. But even within a company, there's massive supply chain, fuel centrally planned. And manages, it's, it's amazing how you get this to the Apple store on time. Rarely do we have to wait. Rarely are there lines, except when it first comes out.
Now, one of the things that about 40 years ago started is that you could now shift some of the manufacturing to places that had manpower resources you never had before, uh, places that had uh, a variety of different infrastructure and logistics that didn't exist before, so that you could now diversify your manufacturing in all kinds of places around the world. You could set up warehouses. You could set up production in all kinds of places around the world. You could also benefit from the skills people had all over the world because by driving the cost of the supply chain down lower and lower, where something was built, where it was assembled, where it was sold, all of those, it didn't matter because the cost of transportation, the cost of coordination, the cost of all of that was relatively minor. One of the things that did that, I did a whole show on this a couple of years ago, I think, was uh, the container ship revolution. Having containers ship goods all over the world and building container ships specially designed to carry containers lowered the cost of shipping of goods to almost zero. There was a period where it was almost zero. There was so much supply of ships that, that prices really went down to almost zero. Now, that happening over the last 40 years has made it possible for goods, primarily for goods, but even some services, to slowly, systematically over time decline in price. If a good that is consumed by people declines in price, just that raises the standard of living. Now, one of the challenges that happen I think, and that we're, we're now coming to grips with, and I think COVID uh, and what happened in Russia has now made this very real, is for a variety of reasons, China became the primary place in which people outsourced to. That is where people uh, set up, if you will, their supply chains, their production, their assembly. And the reasons for this are multiple. Uh, China was opening up. It suddenly had 1.2 billion people who were looking for work. So it was a massive, huge number of available employees wanting to work, willing to work, willing to work hard at pretty much any price because the alternative was so low. It, so it was cheap and massively plentiful. Now, it wasn't very productive labor because they weren't very skilled. But suddenly there was this inflow of massive number of laborers, which was very appealing to a lot of companies to move production to where there were laborers. But it was more than that. Suddenly, by the 1990s and 2000s, China was also producing large numbers, really unbelievable numbers, of engineers, tens of thousands of engineers a year. So if you needed skill labors, really high skill labors, China was the place you went. China also invested massively early on in infrastructure, highways, uh, high-speed trains and ports and airports. So China made it easy to integrate it into the logistics of the world. It had ports. It had massive port capacity. It had a number of amazing natural ports. All it had to do was grow them, improve their technology, and the most advanced Ports in the world, the most advanced ports in the world, well, where robots do most of the work rather than unionized, expensive unionized labor, are in China. So you get this massive increase in technology at the infrastructure level in China, so that if you produced in China, you could easily get the product to the port because of the highway system. 
And then you could easily ship it because the ports were so efficient. Again, computerized, roboticized, not having to deal with unions and corruption and everything else that goes along with it. And therefore, uh, shipping took off. And shipping through China took off. China also has the advantage of sitting on a lot of ocean front, sitting on uh, waters where they can easily go south and then west towards Europe, towards the Suez Canal in Europe, or directly east to the west coast of the United States. So they sit in a beautiful strategic place for the supply chains. So what happened, and, and one other element about China, is that China was embracing business, embracing profit, the, the profit motive, um, embracing foreign investment, embracing foreign expertise to come into China. And it appeared until about six, seven, eight years ago that it was embracing more freedom. It was moving in the right direction. And as a consequence of all that, a consequence of the, uh, the, the geography and the, the fact that uh, uh, you, you know, it had the, it, the investment in infrastructure and the fact that there were all these people available to work where there was low-skilled or high-skilled labor and the fact that the country was becoming more free and the fact that the country was, was uh, welcoming of business and the profit motive and entrepreneurship. Because of all of that, China became a powerhouse, a productive powerhouse. And as part of that, American business started increasing their investment in China. And uh, sadly, what happened is that the supply chain became very narrow, if you will. Uh, companies it, it forgot, forgot ignored, started to ignore the concept of, there used to be, I remember we, we, we talk about this in the 80s and early 90s, used to be a concept of country risk or political risk, which was the idea you don't want to back one particular country too much because, you, you know, you don't know if, if the, the ruler changes or an authoritarian comes to power or they get invaded or something like that. You want to have some country diversification. You want to factor into any investment you make into a country. What is the risk that your, your project gets nationalized? Or what is the risk that uh, uh, sanctions are placed on the country and, and you lose your investment? What is the risk that this country gets engaged in war and, and you lose the project? I have a sense that in the 2000s, maybe in the mid-90s to the, to the mid-20-teens, or maybe until, to, until the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, COVID, people stop thinking about those risks. It's like, what's going to happen to China? Nothing's going to happen to China. Just keep investing. You know, we could invest in India as well. Eh, China's just easier. Let's invest in China. India, uh, infrastructure in India sucks, so we're going to just invest in China. And what happened is that businesses stopped diversifying. They became globalist, but really, they, were they became completely dependent on China, on one avenue, one set of infrastructure projects, one channel for distribution. And I think that that is what, to a large extent, we're suffering today. So a few things have happened since then. One, China's taken a clear turn towards authoritarianism and against markets. It is far less friendly to entrepreneurs, to businesses, to profit than it used to be. It is reverse course and is moving fast towards greater and greater state intervention. It's becoming more and more of a status country. Two, with COVID, we realized that whole countries or whole parts of countries can be literally shut down, locked down, production stopped, zero, nada, ports, Closed. Ships can't go anywhere. COVID destroyed this idea that, in a sense, China or any other country would always be open for business. And we're seeing 
even more of that right now. Where whole cities like Shanghai are shut down because of COVID. Whatever is produced in Shanghai usually is not being produced. People are not going to work. Production is not happening. But the same is true of ports that are closed, shipping can't happen. Or ports on this side of the Atlantic, uh, of the Pacific that can't, uh, Atlantic or Pacific doesn't really matter, that are closed. So there's no unloading, reloading, not a trucker. I mean, just the whole COVID thing created these distortions and perversions, but created an awareness that countries can get shut down, that you can't rely on one path, and that too many of our things get produced in just one place. And then finally, I think the Russia example, here you have a war, completely unexpected. Nobody, no corporation in America, I think, put in a one-year plan the probability of war, even a 10% probability of war. I don't think it was in their minds, their consciousness. It was just not possible. There's no war. War never happens. And then a war happens. And not only does that shut down certain parts of the supply chain, natural gas, oil, wheat, other, other agricultural products that are produced in Ukraine, but then you get sanctions, all kinds of sanctions that shut down whole other parts of the supply chain and basically make both Russia and Ukraine, takes them out of the global trade market, which is having, going to have huge implications for food because uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, that, the, the part of Western Russia, are, are real breadbaskets, and now that food is going nowhere. It's created, of course, we know the problems of natural gas and oil and the dependency of certain parts of the world on particular pipelines, on particular supply chains. And suddenly we realize this conception of just in time, not holding inventory. But much more important than that even, the conception that we can concentrate all of our production, or all of our anything, any part of the supply chain, if we put it into any kind of bottleneck, if we put it into, if we rely just on one country for any particular resource, whether it's food, wheat, like Ukraine and Russia, or whether it's manufacturing, like it is in China, or natural gas for Europe, Russia, that opens it up to real disaster. What we used to call, and somehow I've forgotten, Country risk or political risk. Country risk and political risk are real. Yeah, here they are. We're living it right now. Now, what is the solution to this? Now, many of you think, maybe not many of you, some of you think that the solution is government forcing companies to onshore, government placing tariffs, government controlling trade, government creating, I don't know, reserves of uh, using, the, using emergency provisions to bring in, uh, to fly in, uh, what do you call it, uh, baby formula, government, you know, chewing out CEOs, telling them where to put their plants. And you know that I'm not gonna support any of those. The solution is more freedom. The solution is free trade. The solution is for the United States to lower tariffs to zero unilaterally. The solution then is for businesses in their own self-interest to start diversifying their supply chain. I just read yesterday that Apple is doing that. I've actually been reading this for the last, really since COVID, really since Trump's tariffs that Apple is looking at both Vietnam and at India to put manufacturing plants. I'm eager for the day when people start looking at Africa as a place where they could put manufacturing plants 
and use all that to diversify the supply chain. <laughs> that is, make sure that you're not solely reliable for any piece of the supply chain on one source. I think there's going to be a rush to look for natural resources, whether it's rare metals, whether it's other forms of metals and gases, and make sure that there's not one supply supplier. I think Europe is going to look at pipelines, maybe from Azerbaijan, maybe from UAE, maybe from Israel, to supply it with natural gas over the long run so they're not dependent on Russia. I think manufacturers are going to start moving more manufacturing from China to Mexico, from China to other countries, uh, you know, as long as Mexico doesn't go the route of authoritarianism, which unfortunately it might be. But moving it to other countries where they are good terms of trade with the United States, for example, and where, and they won't move all the manufacturing because, again, you don't want to be totally dependent on Mexico. So they will move some of it, and they will take the hit that comes from less economies of scale in order to achieve diversification when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to sourcing of materials. So I think what you're going to see in the next decade is business, not government, business, diversifying their own supply chains. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brook Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.